That that's absolutely fascinating. You know, so so my next question is, given that this abundance has increased in let's say free societies, I think this is how what you're arguing for me here, uh, incredibly actually, right? You would think that governments would be trying to explain this to their populations, you know, because they they would, they would obviously have much better approval ratings. Uh, <laughs> wouldn't they? <laughs> if, if people you understood so. this, there because because yeah. of this amazing system, the abundance has increased. You would think everybody would be rushing. They would look, 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 look what I've accomplished in these in these few years, right? But instead, you know, it's this human psychology that has uh, challenges sometimes, and I think you have to remember that the political power, the political status, in many cases, is driven by scarcity. It's scarcity that, that lets me, you know, offer a solution. If I can make you believe that you live in this world of scarcity and I'm the one that can, can divide things up fairly and make your life better because you're not getting your fair share of this scarcity that we have here, it, it can yield a political uh, dividend that it can be a problem because now people believe that they're they're challenged uh, economic when they really they really aren't because they're not looking at the underlying facts about what is happening here if I have to depend on you for my sustenance uh, you know versus I can go out and create my own wealth I can create my own uh, resources uh, I'm, I'm not depending on you any longer we tend to have this bias of scarcity to begin with just because people that were worried about things tended to survive, right? I, I hear a noise in the bush and, oh, it could be a rabbit or it could be a rattlesnake. Well, if I run away and it was a rabbit, I'm still alive. But if I think, well, it's a rabbit and it's a rattlesnake and I die, it's like, I don't survive. So we have a survival bias towards being kind of pessimistic worried a little bit about things and uh, very hard to overcome that because that's what's allowed us to survive so i i think that um, we've got these kind of human nature biases and they can be exploited by people who want to achieve political political power i mean think about whether you agree or disagree with what's happening with the climate debate you have to acknowledge that there's a lot of fear that's generated from this climate discussion about the wow, alarmism. Yeah, right. You know, we're going to run out. We're, we're causing these problems and, you know, too much of this. And we've got to limit. We've, we've got, got to, seven years until it's over. Yeah. And we've got. Yeah, we're going to have these problems. A lot of human psychology going on, a lot of political things. But the underlying numbers that we looked at, the economic underlying numbers of of our fundamental basic commodities and these things that we enjoy in our life that really give us the these kinds of lives that we enjoy, those are all becoming much, much more abundant. This is a very positive view of the world. And I don't know if I'm ready to accept it in its entirety, but what I can accept is that this is a very positive vision of the world. And I think that might that in itself, and, it, and it's a fair way of looking at the world because I, I, I trust the analysis at that level. Uh, it's it's a, probably very valuable for people to, to, to be thinking this way about their lives because we know we kind of, at some level, and there's debate on how much of an impact this, this has, we, you know, positive mindset manifests positive things and a negative mindset can manifest very negative things, even in one's body itself, right? Where we have more abundance, at the same time we have kind of a more, uh, you know, a greater pessimism about the future from, from young people. Uh, AOC, you know, is it okay to have children? And, you know, are we running out when we have 10 years left? It's like, what are you talking about? What facts are you talking about that would lead you to that conclusion? Find us something that we're, we're truly running out of, that the price is really increasing. Other than a few uh, products that are highly regulated by government, uh, or the supply is rela uh, regulated by government, the, these uh, time prices have continually t uh, decreased. Um, Jordan Peterson said it's a profoundly optimistic book. And I, I tend to say, well, it's, it, it's a profoundly factual book. 
the facts that we looked at, all the data that we looked at, and we, we, we continue today, we continue to look at where can we find something that has become more scarce or less abundant. And it's been very, very difficult to find something that's become more time expensive, other than once again, these products or services that have a high degree of government involvement. So, and what would be an example of those? Higher education. Mm. You know, and you got the supply and the demand that are both being affected. So the supply is affected because of accreditation and and licensing and all of these things that reduce the supply. And then the demand's being affected because the government is, is providing uh, grants and loans. So if I give you a, a check for ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000, 30000 to go buy a car, what do you think the car dealer's going to do if they know you walk into the door with this check for $20,000? Well, you're going to expect these prices to grow up. So you really have, you don't have this true market there where you have two people that are, you've got a third party that's involved in affecting the, the supply and demand. So higher education, health care. Why are health care prices going so high? Well, you have a high degree of government involvement in, in uh, health care, both on the supply side and the demand side. So it's like you would predict these prices to increase if you've got that third party involvement with government. So those two things, and then the third one, the third big one is is housing. Housing tends to have, have this increase. And it depends on where you're at. If you're in certain parts of the country, you don't have a you know an increase in housing. But where you do, generally if you dig deeper, you'll, you'll discover that the government is involved in restricting the supply of housing through zoning and through other other limits on the supply side. These three items are, I think, you know, critical to many of the social ills, or well, I guess the critical to human flourishing, obviously, but the, the inverse of that, many of the social ills in our society today are tied to these things. These are things that you hear people talking about constantly. Right. I'm wondering if the reason is because of this finding that you have, that these are uniquely you know, kind of inter intervened on uh, areas. Well, right? we were looking at services and we we're trying to find a service that we could analyze. And what we hit on was that there are some medical procedures that are really market driven. Uh, LASIK surgery, your eyes, cosmetic surgery. I want to go in and get, you know, some things done. The prices of those uh, elective market driven healthcare items has been doing this. It's been going down. It hasn't become just, just like, like everything else. Just like everything else, because they're mm -hmm. subject to market pressure, and there's no third party involved in either subsidizing or limiting subsidizing demand or limiting supply. So you've got these market forces that are working, and they're not this government influenced market or restricted market. So you see this abundance appear in those markets. We want everybody to have an education, we want them to have health care, we want them to have housing. But maybe asking and inviting the government to come in into those markets has actually been not a good thing. To me, what I'm thinking right now is, you know, because these are such important things to human beings, it's almost like these areas have almost been weaponized. Again, it, these would be the things that we would want to see, the, the precise opposite trend. Right. Right? Yet, because of our particular interest, ostensibly, in making these available to all, the, the time price has actually increased. That is, a, that is an, a, an absolutely incredible finding. Yeah. So, let's, let's think about uh, higher education. That's the kind of area that I came from. Uh, you know, and we see these prices every year, two to five, eight percent a year, you know, much faster than the rate of inflation. Like, what I mean is no, no wonder there's this student debt, you know? <laughs> yeah. And I mean, that's, that's part of it is like, look, we're going to we're going to give these people these loans. If I walk into the car dealer and I, I can walk in with a fifty thousand dollar loan that someone's going to give to me, it's like, what am I going to buy? The dealer's going to be able to say, look, I know what your demand looks like. I know that you have this subsidy to buy this thing. I'm going to capture that subsidy. Mm. And 
And then, uh, you know, we give you this education. We're really not accountable for it. Think of anything that you buy today that's fifty, a hundred thousand dollars that you don't get some kind of a warranty for, or it represents some kind of collateral. If I want to go open up a, uh, you know, start a plumbing business or uh, uh, some kind of a small business, and I go to the government and I'm eighteen, nineteen years old, they're not going to loan me anything. But if I go and say, I need $100,000 to go to college, that's okay, here, sign, we'll give you that. So we've had this huge distortion on the demand side for higher education, and the suppliers have grabbed all of that subsidy. Mm. And it's tragic, but at the same time, I think we also have these markets that are appearing on the side that say, you know, the Internet, for example, if you really want knowledge, what does it cost you to acquire that today? So education, higher education, in my view, has kind of become this uh, prestige uh, status product that people are buying. It's like you just need to, you know, books and knowledge, you can get that for free. But if you want to have that label, that brand, you know, of a Harvard degree, an Ivy League degree, it's going to be really expensive. And you notice Harvard does not expand the number of seats. They're not a global campus. If you had that kind of demand, what would Apple do? You know, would they limit their iPhone sales to just people in California? Would they say, no, we're going to try to sell this product throughout the planet? So you also have this kind of status thing going on with higher education that, 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 that we see. If you ignore that and you look at the ability for a person <clears throat> to get an equivalent of the four-year degree, just the knowledge and the, and the learning, that's doing this. It's these traditional colleges that are doing that. And it's primarily because you're not buying really an education, you're buying this status and this brand that that degree represents. That's, that's my view of it. So you've mentioned Jordan Peterson a couple of times, so I know that, of course, he's gotten very interested in your super abundance model view of the world and you're actually going to be teaching at the Peterson Academy this this uh, well I guess it's a course yeah what what Jordan's trying to do is he's he's really trying to challenge the traditional higher education market by saying look we've got all these technologies today the ability to record once and then be able to play over and over again and then the cost you pay for it once the marginal cost gets very low so he's invited a number of professors to come in and create these courses that that he is going to 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 offer and he's invited us to come in and do an eight-hour course on our book, Super Abundance. So we're going to go to Miami next week and record that. And then uh, I think he's going to try to, to publish it uh, sometime early next year. But I think you're seeing lots of these kinds of institutions emerge, Coursera, that recognize that, look, we can create this knowledge in the form of courses. And once we've done that, uh, we can actually distribute it uh, on the internet and then everyone has access to this knowledge that that has historically been really really it's really expensive to go to a four-year school and live there for four years and give up four years of time uh, but if you can if you can circumvent that and say really what I want to do is get the knowledge um, we can do that very very inexpensively today and so lots of innovation happening in higher ed everybody on the planet if they've got a smartphone, uh, they can access this knowledge that you and I, you know, have took us four years and a hundred thousand dollars to go by. So that opportunity for everybody to get on learning curves, to get this education, to get this knowledge, and then turn around and become a contributor. Wealth is knowledge changes this paradigm instead of being competitors over uh, fixed number of atoms, we now become collaborators in this discovery of new knowledge. So it changes our relationship with each other. And I think that's also really, really an important thing to recognize and understand. That now, you know, we can create value for one another. We're not competitors, we're collaborators in this process. But I always found that, that the sort of in-person learning with the, with the instructor, professor, whatnot, and with that interaction 
was absolutely the most valuable, like just being in class. I did most of my learning that way. I'd get these big textbooks. I'd be kind of, you know, I'd read what I had to. And I wonder how this new information ecosystem, because there's also this sort of, isol at some level, there's also an isolation too. Of course, you can reach across the internet. That, that, that facilitates something. But what we saw, for example, during the pandemic, right, was a, a lot of kids not being able to do the in-person learning right? That actually dramatically limited their learning, period. I'm a little bit suspect of the, the internet learning as becoming a dominant form of learning. I guess that's what I'm saying. Uh, I, while at the same time, um, I, I, of course, I welcome the, the, the abundance of opportunity there. Yeah. Well, one of the old sayings is, look, uh, the best way to learn is uh, sitting on a log with Socrates at the other end of the log where you can have these these dialogues with people that really uh, have this knowledge and have this time but that's really really expensive to do that I think what we're trying to figure out is how can we take the very best teachers on the planet and leverage their ability and we went through this COVID and we did try to do the zoom thing but I think that the the paradigm going forward is going to be how do we how do I identify the best teacher for you and maybe use this AI ability to now uh, create a teacher that's really your personal teacher and try to add the personality and, and the emotion and all these other things to it in such a way that that you now become engaged uh, because there's there's students in classrooms that are really bored with a live teacher right what I noticed over over uh, Zoom is that that I had students that were really bored in my class that really became engaged with Zoom. So it was an interesting kind of a, a, a change with, with that. And what I recognize is if this student was able to have this one-on-one -on -one conversation with a teacher that really understood their needs, was very patient and very knowledgeable, that that has this potential to really increase their knowledge productivity or their ability to really learn much faster. So as we explore that, and I, I think this is one of the great hopes of, of AI is that it's going to allow us to offer a much more personalized and productive ability for every individual to learn much faster. And it also could help you teach much better. If you really had an AI that could help you as a teacher to understand what the needs were for each and every student, you could you could formulate your lectures and your content that would really be able to help them understand much faster, much better. So the question is really, how much knowledge per hour can we try to create? Knowledge per hour, we call it the KPH. What is the KPH that we're going to be able to move to? Can we use technology? Can we use freedom? Can we use markets? Can we use these things to help people to discover knowledge and share knowledge? Because that's really what wealth is ultimately going to be is. You know, when I, when I was hearing you talk about AI, you know, the first version where the AI becomes the teacher, I'm very, I'm, I'm actually quite concerned about that version. But then I was thinking to myself, no, like the a real powerful way would be your, your, your second option, which is where the AI is used to augment the ability or or perhaps also the distribution of the actual teaching of a very effective professor, which I'm getting a feeling just from our conversation here, you have been one. <laughs> well, some of my students think it, there's others that would disagree. <laughs> but, I, you know, you think about the very best teacher you had in your life. If you could have that teacher teach you these other subjects, would your life be different? If that teacher, who I think really probably loved you and also loved the subject, was able to teach you with kind of infinite patience and also had, had this knowledge that they could put in an order and, and be able to continually determine whether or not you're learning before they try to go to the next uh, idea. If you had that ability where people could, could tap into that powerful teacher, I mean, it could be profound. Some of these young boys are just not thriving in a classroom. Well, why not? We better get serious about exploring new ways that we can use different our resources in new ways that we can really tap into their to their uh, 
what's happening that we would have to change that would would allow them to be uh, much more engaged in the material. You know, why aren't you interested in this? Is it because you're just too young? You don't have the desire to learn? Is it a maturity issue? What is it? The AI things that we're working on could give us great insight as to what we could do to help you know, this rising generation have a much greater opportunity to, to learn and contribute. Well, Gail, uh, this is absolutely a scintillating conversation for me. Um, you've given me a lot of food for thought here. Uh, any final thoughts as we finish? You know, I would just say, look, uh, part of what we, we come to, came to understand is, is every human being on this planet has this potential to discover valuable new knowledge. And we don't know who the next Steve Jobs or Mozart or Thomas Edison or Elon Musk, we don't know who they are. We know that they're probably out there somewhere. Steve Jobs, he was, uh, his father, his biological fa father was from Syria. Well, imagine if Steve had grown up in Syria instead of San Jose. Do you think his life would be different? Do you think our lives would be different? Well, he was fortunate that he was able to be in a place where he was able to flourish, where he had the freedom, he had people around him, he had all of these things that allowed him to really flourish and really start to explore what his potential was. So the question is, is how many Steve Jobs are in Syria today? They're all over the planet. And, and if we can genuinely seek to, to extend opportunity and the freedom to innovate, the freedom really to learn to as many people as we can on this planet, it's going to be benefit all of us. And um, so uh, I think part of it is, is we have this kind of moral uh, view as well that says this abundance that we're enjoying today is because people were willing to, they had the time to be able to devote to, the, to discovering this new knowledge and then they shared it with the rest of us. And by the way, they lived lives that were much less abundant than our lives. Think of your grandparents, what their life was. They had a much lower standard of living than you and I did, but they devoted their resources, a portion of their resources, to investing in this knowledge discovery process. So we're all benefiting from that today. Well, I'll, I'll make one comment as we finish. And, you know, one of the things that strikes me is that while they may have had less abundance, right? Those people earlier, your, your forefathers, uh, foremothers, they might have had more meaning in their life though, because this is, as, as everyone will say, there is a certain kind of a crisis of meaning. What I find very interesting about your model is I think it's also, you know, provides at least a little bit for rekindling some of that. So anyway. Yeah, um, uh, I'll, I'll hit you one more time on this one. You know, Jordan Peterson talks about we find meaning in our suffering. And that's true. We can find meaning in suffering. But I also think that we can find meaning in our creativity. If you're not allowed to create, we have these ideas that come to us all the time. And if we are living in a place that encourages us to to be creative friendly, entrepreneurial friendly, uh, those places tend to produce all of this fruit that the rest of us on the planet are able to enjoy. So let's extend this, uh, these environments to as much of the, the population as possible. And then we can lift one another out of uh, our conditions. Well, Gail Pooley, it's such a pleasure to have had you on. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.